Um, so first of all, we are the Central Vermont Solid Waste Management District. And we, while we don't have a, um, a uh, transfer station that we run, we do have an additional recyclables collection center that we'll be talking about later in the webinar. And we do a lot of programming and outreach to help people understand what goes in the bin and what stays out and all the extra things you can recycle. Um, this webinar is paid for in part through a grant from the USDA Rural Utility Service. So we just want to thank our, um, our funder for providing the staff time for developing and holding these webinars. Um, we have a couple other webinars. One is about backyard composting basics and the other is called Don't Flush That and it's about reducing and replacing toxins in your home. So if you go to our website, cvswmd.org, um, you could sign up for one of those. I think we've got uh, one more of each webinar through the month of September, and then they're on pause until next year. Um, and we will also be sending out a recording of this webinar after, after the fact. Um, housekeeping things are mainly that if you have a question, please use the Q&A box down below. Um, we do have a chat box. We ask that you reserve that for comments. Um, so because while we're going to be checking the question box as we go through the webinar and we'll have a Q&A section at the end, but it's easier for us if we're just looking in the Q&A. If, if you have a comment or there's something you know about that wasn't mentioned or anything to that effect, put it in the chat box. Everybody can see that, but we're the only ones who see the questions. Um, and finally, we do have all of you muted. It's just, um, so I hope you don't take offense at that. It just helps us present better. Um, so we appreciate your patience with that piece and you can still communicate with us through the chat box. Um, okay, I'm gonna hand it over to Theron to introduce himself and then we'll get started. Hi everybody, my name is Theron and I'm the outreach coordinator here at the Central Vermont Solid Waste Management District. So, Let's begin the presentation and figure out how we can do a better job of recycling. Okay, so first we're just going to do a quick overview um, of what we're going to talk about today. Um, pretty much we're going to review the Universal Recycling Law, which in, is Act 148 in Vermont. And that won't be a huge part of the presentation, but it's really important information to just kind of understand what what the law actually covers and what, what is meant by the word recycling in that. Um, and then we'll take some time to um, specifically talk about each item that is, that is covered in the law. What is that, you know, there's, we'll go into those details and what goes in the bin and what goes out, well, that'll be a big section there. Um, Theron will talk about contamination um, and what that means, why it's called contamination and how that affects the recycling systems. Um, and then we'll spend some time looking at additional recycling and that that'll be the things that are really important to keep out of the landfill and do have recycling outlets, but they don't go in your usual blue bin recycling. So um, let's get started. Theron will start talking about the law. All right. So Act 148, the Universal Recycling Law in Vermont. And this law um, has been around for a number of years, uh, actually about five years, and it covers recyclables, food scraps, and a couple other things like clean wood and, and other things that have uh, value for reuse that, um, that are better to keep out of the landfill. Uh, it also has a number of landfill bans. So like I said, recyclables, um, those were banned from the landfill tw in 2015. Food scraps have been um, required to be diverted by large institutions and businesses, places that generate a lot of food scraps like restaurants and grocery stores. Um, and then more recently, since July 1st this year, everybody in Vermont has been uh, required to divert their food scraps and keep them out of the trash for a number of reasons. <clears throat> uh, this law also covers leaf and yard waste, which don't need to go in the landfill either, they will decompose. Um, and clean wood, which is also not a hazardous substance. And um, all these things, they have different outlets that are and, and or higher and better uses. And they also take up a lot of space in the landfill. So in Vermont, we only have the one landfill up in Coventry. 
And it's important that we use that wisely and that we don't fill it with things that we can put other places or reuse or um, other, otherwise do a better job of managing. So <clears throat> recycling in this pandemic, in the time of COVID-19, um, it's important to remember that recycling is an essential service. We want to thank all of <clears throat> our haulers and our recyclers and thank everybody who's continuing to do the work of keeping these materials out of the landfill. Um, and also the people who are working every, every week, every day to pick up and move and sort all of the materials that we generate, all of the waste materials that we generate and work to get those <clears throat> to the right places and to reuse and make sure those materials are not being wasted. Um, pickups have changed only slightly. Um, haulers are generally asking people not to wait outside by the at the curbside when they're having their waste picked up. <clears throat> they're also asking them to put their materials out the night before so it's quicker and easier. Um, and then there's just there's just different um, protocols like everywhere else. There's there's more personal protective equipment. There's more protocols around hand washing and sanita sanitation and and other things like that. Um, but generally speaking, uh, it's very similar to the way it's been done. Um, we've just instituted a number of protocols as have the haulers that protect their staff um, in this time. So mandatory recycling. And, um, and this, is, this is what's covered in that Act 148 law. Um, these are the materials that are supposed to be kept out of the trash, out of the landfill. And that is because they have, as I mentioned before, higher and better uses. You can recycle all of these materials and integrate them into new products and make new things out of them that would, um, would otherwise require the, the extraction and processing of raw materials, which is more energy intensive and um, more polluting. So uh, we're into the we're getting into the blue bin section. Um, Cassandra, if you want to hop back in, we can we can let you talk about the blue bin. Um, but I'm just going to run through this list. It's paper, glass, steel, aluminum, cardboard, rigid plastics, and that's it. That's what goes in the blue bin. So uh, over to you, Cassandra. All right, stay on the slide one second. I just yeah. wanted um, before our next slide, we're going to go into each one of these. Um, each one of these materials in a little bit more depth. But I just want to point out that there are only six categories. So when you hear that you have to recycle in Vermont, we're talking about these six categories, paper, glass, steel, aluminum, cardboard, rigid plastics. And we will, I'll be going over what rigid means for plastics and all of that. And I also want to call attention to that final bullet point, anything else is contamination. So um, and that's something we'll, that Theron will be talking about in more depth after I review all of the blue bin materials. Um, and we really mean anything else. Nothing else goes in your blue bin except those six categories. And there are some exceptions for each one. So let's uh, dive into that slide and I'm ready for that, Theron. Um, I also wanted to mention that the Universal Recycling Law was actually passed in Vermont in 2012. So it's been around for eight years. We started implementing it as a state in 2014 with um, you know, different steps every year leading up to 2020. Um, but even before the 2012 Act 148 was passed, the Central Vermont Solid Waste Management District actually had a mandatory recycling ordinance in place for almost 15 years prior to that. So this isn't really new in our district, but I think having a statewide law kind of caught people's attention who weren't aware of the district-wide ordinance prior to that. So it still may feel new to a lot of people, but this has actually been in place for quite a long time in our area. Okay, so what do we mean when we say recyclables? Let's start with, uh, next slide. I think we're gonna start with paper. I'll wait till the slide advances. Um, but keep in mind that every, every category paper has a few things that still don't go in. So, but what do we mean by paper? Typically, that would be office paper, glossy paper, junk mail, inserts, magazines, um, almost everything that's paper, even paperback books 
and hardcover books if the covers are taken off. But we hope that you have other better things to do with books, but if they really are ready for the recycle bin, they can go in as well. Um, I also wanted to point out that um, paper is an organic material. It's made from trees. So I don't mean organic in the sense of like certified organic. I mean, it's an, it's, it's an organic the way anything that decomposes back into its, um, you know, it, if it was ever a plant or animal is an organic material. So it is one of those materials that actually contributes to methane when it's decomposing in the landfill, um, just like food scraps. It's not as intense as food scraps, but that's, that's one of the reasons to keep paper out. The other reason is it's a, it's one of the, it's a highly valuable recyclable and it's, it's ruined if it goes in the landfill and it has a purpose and a use and more life if it stays out and it all comes down to trees. So the more paper we recycle, you know, the less we're cutting virgin woods for that. Um, so there's some kinds of paper that stay out of the bin. Um, anything that's wet or moldy would stay out. That's going to contaminate the whole batch. Hardcover books, but as I said earlier, you can take the covers off and recycle the paper inside. Um, I just did that. It was the first time I ever threw a hardcover book in the recycling bin, but it was it was one of those old but not particularly valuable books um, with nothing of interest, all outdated information. So I just took the cover off, threw it in the bin. Any papers lined with plastic? Um, so I think the kinds of things I see like that these days, there used to be dog food bags, it used to be the paper on the outside and a plastic liner on the inside. I think they're mostly fully plastic now. Um, but there's a lot of like sometimes at a bakery, you'll get a pay. It looks like a paper bag, but actually it's a thin layer of plastic inside. Those don't go in the bin unless you're one of those people that's um, really into it and you take the plastic liner out. Otherwise, that's trash. Um, animal feed bags fall into that category. They're not really paper um, and cartons like um, I'm thinking of milk or juice cartons with the gable tops. Those um, look like box board, but they have, um, they actually have a couple layers of material and a, and a very hard to see plastic liner built into them. And Tetra Pak, that refers to those, um, those cartons that you see soy milk, almond milk in, they're kind of rectangle shape. Those are not paper and they're not recyclable. In Vermont, there are other states and other regions where you can recycle Tetra Pak and gable top cartons, but in our state, we can't. And before we go on to the next slide, that actually brings me to another point that I think is really important to understand when you're thinking about recycling. And that point is that it's all about the markets. Um, it's about how much volume of material we have and who's buying it and where it can go. If we don't have volume and we don't have uh, somewhere to sell it, then we don't have recycling. So that's why it's so important to really pay attention to what goes in and what stays out uh, we can't sell it if it has wet or moldy stuff in it or if it has contamination. And conversely, there are certain things we just can't market because in our state, we can't generate enough value or volume, excuse me, to make it worth it for a recycler to spend the um, money on the trucking and staffing to come pick it up. And Tetra Pak is one of those things that's a highly recyclable material, but we just don't have that volume in Vermont. Um, the last thing I want to point out is this slide does show shredded paper mixed in with uh, regular office paper, and that is actually not how it should look in your blue bin. Shredded paper can go into a clear um, plastic bag, and it should be tied shut. I actually put my shredded paper in my compost bin, use it as a carbon in compost, so it never goes in the recycling. But if you're not composting, um, it should go in a clear plastic bag, and that is the only instance when a when plastic bag would go into recycling. And we'll talk about that more. Um, that plastic bags are one of the really bad contaminants in recycling, except for in this one case. Um, okay, enough about paper. Let's go to the next slide. So cardboard, sort of on the same theme of paper. It's basically, when you see the word cardboard, it's referring to box, uh, sorry, corrugated cardboard. Box board is like cereal boxes is also recyclable. I think we just covered that under paper. Um, so even pizza boxes are okay to recycle now. They used to not be accepted. Um, we just, you just have to make sure they don't have actual food debris on them. If they have a little grease stain or something, that's fine. But if it's um, covered in food, obviously anything that's food contaminated does not go in the recycling bin. But cardboard is probably the easiest and simplest. Just cardboard, 
flatten it out, break it down, um, but nothing that's wet or moldy or lined with plastic or waxed cardboard. And I don't know if they're still using those waxed cardboard boxes for produce, but that's where you usually see them. If you get boxes from the grocery store, there's often waxed boxes used for shipping produce and those can't be recycled. Those are trash when you're done with them. Next slide. Um, aluminum. Aluminum is, is a highly recyclable material and I can't remember the number. If you look it up though, we could send it to you later. Some huge percentage of all aluminum ever that use that is in use right now has been recycled. It's one of the few materials that doesn't lose any value as it's recycled. It, it, it maintains its integrity. So it's really important that anything aluminum gets goes back in that bin. It's a really valuable material and there's a really um, kind of environmentally destructive process for actually mining aluminum and turning it into aluminum foil and cans. So the more we can get, that's an easy thing to recycle. Um, there's a couple of things you might not have thought of with aluminum. Obviously aluminum cans, we all know about that. You see this picture of foil up here in the corner. Um, that is, aluminum foil can be recycled. All you have to do is make sure you have enough so when you ball it up, you don't put it in flat, it gets balled up. And it ha I, we recommend you wait till you have enough. So when you ball it up, it's about the size of a tennis ball. And you can include like those uh, foil lids on yogurt containers, just rinse them off. You don't want food debris. So it might mean a quick rinse or wipe down of your foil, let it dry. Um, often what I'll do, if I have one piece of aluminum foil, like a bigger piece, if I've covered a lasagna or something, I wipe it down, make sure it's clean. And then over the next couple of weeks, you know, any of those little metal lids from yogurt cups. I even put the foil, if anyone else eats chocolate, it's usually wrapped in aluminum in some kind of foil. You can put that in. So those little pieces, you just ball them up inside a big piece. And then once it's bigger than a tennis ball, you can throw it in your recycling bin. Um, but the things that do not go in the bin are things like aluminum siding, scrap metal, pots and pans. Those can all be recycled with a metal recycler. Like in our area, Bulldogs is a metal recycler where you can take those kinds of things. Or um, in the Hardwick area, there's gate salvage or all metal recycling. Um, find out who the metal recycler is near you. And if you can't get there or if it's not worth it for small things, there's usually dozens of people who go around and pick up metal from people's houses and then and then they bring it to the um, metal recycling place. So all you have to do is put out a post and front porch form or ask your neighbors and someone will take your metal for you. Next slide. Um, and this is the last thing on metal for recycling, steel. So steel in this case, pretty much um, most of the time is referring to like food grade cans. So um, that would be like your tomato sauces, beans, whatever you, you know, you get canned foods, that's steel. Um, this image here shows the kinds of cans that might be like sardine cans or those are all recyclable. Um, if they are, I mean, this is something that we should, you know, we need to mention, maybe should have mentioned earlier, but if you have something like a can or a bottle or plastic that has had food in it, it should be rinsed out. Um, if it's really like a strong thing, like in the case of a fish or a sardine can, it should be, it should be washed with soap and water. But typically recyclables only need a quick rinse. It, it's not, you don't have to put it through the dishwasher or make a big production out of it. But there are some things like mayonnaise jars or peanut butter jars or these tuna fish cans that need a little bit more to get the food debris off of them. So steel is mostly um, food grade cans and we're not talking about appliances, scrap metal, pesticide sprays, paint cans. Those all have different places they can be recycled, but they don't go in your blue bin. Next slide. Um, glass. And um, so glass is, again, it's mostly referring to like glass bottles that you drink out of. Um, and there's some examples here, wine glasses, um, glass jars, beer bottles. Um, of course, in Vermont, we have a bottle bill. So you can often um, actually get your deposit back on some of the beer bottles and other stuff. But um, soda bottles. Um, so it's typically food grade glass. We're not talking about like um, a glass that you drink out of or window glass or light bulbs. Those are all slightly different kind of glass and they don't go in the recycling bin. Or broken glass. Um, that's a confusing one because we all know once it gets to the recycling center, it is going to be 
actually broken and to the point where it will resemble sand when they're done. But on its way there, it's more about the health and safety of the people handling your recyclables. There's a few steps between your house and getting to the sorting facility in our area that's called the MRF, the Material Recovery Facility. Um, so in order to protect the safety of the people handling your recyclables, broken glass should go into a box or a paper bag and just put that in the trash. Next slide. Hard plastics. Okay, so this is a place, I'm going to just pause here. We're going to talk about which hard plastics we're talking about, but there's a lot of layers of what we're looking at in this image too. So first of all, I'll just say earlier we called this um, category rigid plastics. Um, the point is we're not talking about flexible plastics. So flexible plastic might be a plastic bag or um, pretty much any plastic film, you know. So plastic, anything that's bendable, stretchy, that is, does not go in your blue bin. There is a way to recycle that stuff and we will talk about that in a little bit. But if it's a plastic bag, if it's a stretchy plastic at all, it stays out of your regular recycling. And in a few minutes, Theron is gonna show you exactly why. Um, it really becomes an economic, financial and health and safety problem down the line when plastic bags go in the recycling bin. With the one exception of bagging your shredded paper. And that's because when it goes on the, it'll go on a conveyor belt when it goes into the MRF and there's workers who can just grab it off the conveyor belt. They'll know what it is because it's, if it's clear plastic bag, they'll see the shredded paper. But otherwise it stays out of the bin. Um, styrofoam is also on the not to be recycled list. And that, so here we are down into the layers. So one of the layers is, um, everybody's familiar with the chasing arrow recycle symbol with the numbers inside, one through seven. Um, those numbers each refer to a different kind of plastic. Uh, though, and, and in the past, we've been taught, you know, you can recycle one and two, but not five and six, or one, two, and seven, but, um, and that is still relevant. But essentially, those numbers are for manufacturers. They're not, necessarily for the general public. So it can be confusing when we say don't recycle styrofoam because you'll see a chasing arrow and a number in there because styrofoam is plastic, but it is not recyclable in our area. Um, so I'm asking you to forget about the numbers. In the Central Vermont Solid Waste Management District, you can recycle pretty much, I wouldn't say all, but most rigid plastics. So, and you see examples down here, you know, that's like a takeout container, different kinds of shampoo or lotion bottles, all of these. Um, but um, we take no, one through seven, not all, not everyone does. There are places in Vermont that only take ones and twos, but we're pretty local. So we're asking local folks, um, yes, pay attention to the numbers, but don't sweat it. Um, it's more important that you're not putting the things that don't go in the bin in the bin. So. Don't put styrofoam in the bin. Certain plastic bags have, a, have that number on them. Like if you ever buy frozen vegetables, some of those bags will have like a number four inside the recycle symbol. Well, that's referring to a certain kind of plastic, but it does not get recycled in your blue bin. Um, anything that contained hazardous waste, that's a whole other subject also. So thinking uh, a typical example is like if you change the oil in your car, you're gonna have a bunch of those black plastic oil um, jugs. Um, oil, uh, any automotive fluid is considered a household hazardous waste. So that actually goes in the trash, believe it or not, not in the recycling bin. Um, and any plastic that is black cannot be recycled in Vermont, at least not in the central Vermont solid waste district area. And there's a long explanation behind it, but the short answer is back to when we were talking about markets and volume. In Vermont, we don't have enough volume to separate black plastic out and market it as a separate material. And when it's mixed and co-mingled with all of the other plastics, it contaminates all of them with the black dye. And so they can't get clear uh, or white or light colors. They can, it, it becomes a problematic. So rather than, um, and it's less than 1% of the total amount of plastic that comes through the MRF. So they just don't take it. So if you get something like a sushi tray or a, um, Rotisserie chicken, you, those go in the trash. Next slide, please. 
Um, finally, I'm just going to uh, show you this and we actually do provide this as a handout. Um, if, if anybody wants it, we, we have a follow up email you'll all get and it will have a recording of the webinar and some re resources and handouts that have all this info so you could like print it and put it on your fridge or near your recycle bin. So this does actually show you what the numbers mean and it's really interesting. Um, just keep in mind at this time in our district. Um, you can put numbers one through seven in the bin, but you have to know those exceptions. Like obviously no bags, right? And obviously no styrofoam. So if you know the exceptions, um, just it's easier to remember rigid plastics than it is to remember which numbers because those numbers can apply to a lot of kinds of material. Next slide. Um, okay, so the bottom line, and I kind of just said that, is that uh, just, you know, the thing I just said about hard plastics, when you're thinking about what kind of plastic goes in the bin, just think of, you know, if it's hard and rigid, as opposed to flexible and stretchy or like, you know, breaking apart like styrofoam. Um, know what does and does not go in the bin. So you're starting that right now. Um, and check with your sol solid waste district, um, right? I'm, I'm not sure exactly where everybody is who's logged on right now, but, um, some of you might be from a different solid waste district. So things are a little bit different depending what region you're in in the state. So make sure you check with your own solid waste management district. And it's real easy to find. You just Google like solid waste management district Vermont and, a, and you'll get a map and it will show your town and where your district is. Um, so I'm, th that was a lot all, all at once. So I'm gonna just pause. I don't see any questions in the Q and A box. Um, so I'm going to give you a minute if anybody has a question, um, and if not, we'll move on. Theron's going to go into a lot more detail about all of those things that don't go in the bin and why, and he's going to tell you exactly what contamination is and why. Um, okay, so Kathy asks, do Keurig cups recycle? Um, Kathy, you just touched on one of my biggest pet peeves of my life. <laughs> so there's a long and a short answer. Um, the short answer is no. The short answer is they are trash. And I've, you know, in the beginning of the time when I, you know, when I started doing this work about five or six years ago, I used to read every year they'd say, if you lined up every Keurig cup, it would wrap around the world four times. And then the next year it was, if you lined up every Keurig cup that ever went in the trash, it would wrap around the world five times. Who knows how many times they, you know, that, but the point is, they are um, designed to be disposable and they're, they're combined materials. So you have plastic cup, but you also have the coffee grounds inside. So it's automatically contaminating. And I've seen people very, you know, very earnestly dumping the coffee grounds into the compost so they could recycle the cups. But then we have another problem with the cups, which is, uh, I haven't mentioned this yet, and Theron will talk about it, um, the, Anything that's smaller than two inches by two inches on any two dimensions, it's called the two by two rule, doesn't go in your bin. So um, I don't know if you remember from that plastic, hard plastic slide, but all the pictures of bottles showed the caps screwed onto the bottles. That's because the bottle caps can go back in recycling as long as they're screwed onto the bottles. But if they're loose, they go in the trash and Keurig cups are the same thing. I would recommend if you like your Keurig, to get one of those, um, you can get a reusable. Um, they, I even Walmart has them, they're sold all over the place. And then of course we also, um, yeah, that's the end of that. Um, CW says, where is plastic sent? What county? I heard that it used to go to China, but now it goes to other countries. Oh, what country, sorry. Um, I'm gonna save that question because we actually go into that in a little bit more detail in a few minutes. Um, so Erica, we're going to take one last question and then save your questions. We'll, we'll, we'll be stopping in a, a couple more times throughout the presentation and then we'll go into, um, you know, like about 10 or 15 minutes of Q&A at the end. Um, Erica says, can you talk about lids like a metal lid on a glass jar? What size lids can be recycled? Pumps on lotion containers? Great question. And um, I apologize, I didn't bring that up earlier. Um, Theron will go into more detail also, but the short answer is if you have any lid, um, plastic or metal, if, it's, if the diameter of it is wider than two inches, it can go in your bin, loose or loose. Um, if it is smaller than two inches, 
It can, if it's plastic, it can go back on the plastic bottle and go in your bin. Um, if it's a metal lid, like on a glass jar, um, it has to be bigger than two inches across and it should not go back on the glass jar. It would go in separately. If it's a small metal lid, um, you can't put it in your recycling bin, but you can save it. We actually take small metals for recycling at our facility, the ARC, and we will be going into more detail about the ARC in a little while. Um, but any metal you can save, even if you save it in a bucket or something, and eventually get it to a metal recycler. Um, pumps on a lotion container. Um, we used to take those at the ARC. You'd have to check our website, cvswmd.org. We've had so many changes recently, I don't have them all memorized. But if we don't take them at the ARC, then those are also trash, unfortunately. Um, so I'm going to... Um, ask Theron to pop on and um, we'll go to the next slide and Theron will go into more depth, um, starting with um, knowing the rules. Hi, everybody. All right, as uh, Cassandra started to explain, we've, there are a couple of rules that are applicable to everything that we put in the blue bin. So um, start out with no bags or textiles or things like that. That includes plastic bags, fabric bags, uh, clothing, uh, also long stringy things like electrical cords or rope, things like that are all considered tanglers. And what happens with those materials is they get wound up around the, the rotating parts of the machinery at the recycling plant. And they clog those machines in such a way that they have to shut down the entire facility and send people in um, with climbing harnesses to cut with knives all that all that um, those tangler materials out of the machinery. Um, that could that could also include wires. So just long things that um, that are potential tanglers you should keep out of your bin. Again, um, we always go back to the fact that there are those six mandated recyclables and everything else should be kept out. Um, things that are, um, that are dirty or wet should also be kept out. So uh, you don't wanna put in uh, a jar with, um, that's half, still half full of peanut butter or something. That is something that will attract rodents and bugs and create health issues for, um, and health concerns for the people who work at those um, recycling facilities every day sorting those materials. It's also just nasty. So, um, so what you want to do with your recycling is give it a rinse. Um, it, you know, with peanut butter, you might have to soak it, but that you should rinse that stuff out so that it's not stuck on there. It's not full of, of old food. Um, it's not wet because uh, the wetness will, will, um, It'll make the paper products um, an issue. And then also just, as I mentioned, there's the, the health concerns around having old food in the, in the recycling. Uh, Cassandra also mentioned the two by two rule. So um, in the machinery that sorts the recyclables, there are gaps and those gaps are about two inches. So um, if you want to put something in your blue bin in your, in your um, zero sort recycling. It has to be bigger than two inches by two inches. So that's about the size of a baseball. Um, and uh, if it's smaller than that, it's going to fall in through the, gra through the gaps and it's going to get mixed in with all the crushed glass and become contamination. We'll talk a little bit later about why that's an issue. Um, it also, the, those systems are also not designed <clears throat> to take anything greater than two feet by two feet. Uh, so for example, um, you can't put a computer in there, but that's, or you couldn't put like an office chair or something. Um, but those are obviously also not on the list. So um, if you can think of anything like maybe, let's say like a five gallon bucket, that's, that's too big. It's, it's greater than two feet by two feet. Um, and then no bags. That's an issue because of the tanglers, um, but um, you, you also don't want to have your recycling bagged. 
The only thing that you want to have bagged is that shredded paper. And if you are not sure, you can always throw it away. Um, the important thing is to try to keep this, this stream of recyclables as clean, as uncontaminated as possible, so that it's easy to turn it back into a valuable resource for making something else out of. <clears throat> oh, not sure how that happened. Okay, let's see. Hmm. All right. <clears throat> so, does it get, does it really get recycled? Um, <clears throat> the answer is ideally yes. Um, in Vermont, uh, I know somebody had a question about um, where plastics go. So Vermont um, relies heavily on domestic markets. So pretty much everything that we get here in Vermont is sent to uh, sent to the U.S. And from there, it is it is sorted and sent to other places um, sometimes. But you know we we try to get all of our materials sent to. Places um, like uh, there, I know that a lot of plastics get sent down south um, on the East Coast. Uh, some paper products, I believe, are sent to Canada or were. Um, so yeah, the things that you put in those in those bins, if they're the correct things, they will be recycled and reused for something. <clears throat> so <clears throat> we're talking about contamination now. Um, this is a picture of the West Rock paper mill in Sheldon, Vermont, and all the stuff that you see here that this guy is holding, this stuff is all shredded plastics and um, other things that have been filtered out of the, of the paper. Um, contamination matters because if you want to make something out of any sort of material, it's going to be a lot easier to do if you just have one thing, if you have um, just plastic, or if you have just metal, or if you have just paper. Um, if you have all of the stuff that you, all your waste and it's different materials and it's all mixed up, it's really complicated to sort it all out. Um, it's, it's difficult and so the, the paper mill, for example, has a very elaborate and complex system of filters and of, um, of processing machines that do filter out and, and clean the, the fiber material that they then use to create things like spaghetti boxes and toilet paper and stuff like that. Um, the other thing is that is expensive. It's expensive to process all that stuff, and it's a lot cheaper if you can sort it out at the beginning, um, if the consumer, the person who's generating that waste, can put their metal in one place and put their paper in another place and put their plastic in another place. That makes it a lot easier down the line and a lot cheaper. And with the fluctuation of markets, which has been especially volatile recently, um, it makes it a lot easier for those materials to be recycled. Um, so then there's, then there's glass. Glass is difficult to recycle. There's no way around it. Um, there, it's cheaper to make new glass than to, than to um, recycle it um, and melt it down into new bottles. There are other ways to use glass. Um, you can use it as, you can mix it into roadway aggregate fill. Um, you can use it to, um, as, a, as a, a filler for, for some products. You can turn it into fiberglass, um, but it is a problem. Uh, and there, there have been, it has been in the news recently that, um, that it's difficult to recycle glass. So that's, that is a, that is a, um, a reality. So um, one of the things that you can do if you're trying to make an impact on that is you can think about reusing glass. You can think about ways that you can um, take jars that you use, for example, and use them for canning or use them to store other things. Um, you can also 
um, make differences in the way that you purchase things. You can, for example, um, choose to buy things that are made of more recyclable materials like aluminum um, and, you know, buy drinks, for example, in aluminum containers like cans. Um, that's, a, that's a good way to make an impact on that and also to reduce the, the volume of things that are particularly hard to recycle. Um, the same, the same attitude applies to uh, all of your purchases. And if you're, for example, um, if you're at the grocery store, just think about those things that are recyclable and the things that are not. For example, if you are buying containers that are made of black plastic, you know that they're gonna have to go in the trash because they're not recyclable in Vermont. Same thing with, with styrofoam. So um, in your purchasing, in your habits, um, try to choose materials that you know are recyclable. And this presentation will give you a better idea of, of what those items are. And if you can, uh, try to choose those when you're, when you're making your, your purchases. So, uh, like we said, anything that's not on that list of the statewide six is, is not, um, considered recyclable and it is considered contamination. Um, and uh, here's an image of, of the workers there uh, cutting the materials out of the sorting machinery. You see all of these plastic bags and uh, I see maybe there's some, some fabric in there and they're in there, um, they're cutting the, the, that material out of the machinery so that they can continue, just so that they can continue running it and sorting the rest of the recyclables. And this is very time consuming and it's dangerous. You have to send these, um, these folks in there, um, you have to shut the whole machinery, the whole, the, whole, um, the whole facility down just so they can do that. And I don't remember exactly how often they have to do that, but, um, but really at, doing it at all is too often. The other issue with that is that all these plastic bags, they, a lot of them look like grocery bags. Those things can be recycled. They can be brought back to the grocery store. They have, um, they have those plastic bag bins. Um, we do have a plastic bag ban now in Vermont. And so that is designed to help with this and to, to keep our, our facilities that, that sort our recyclables more operational. So um, here's just a little more detail on the common contaminants like the tanglers. Um, you can see in this image, there's, there's like garden hoses and there's clothes. Um, the garden hoses, you can just put in the trash. The clothes, um, you can donate to a place like Goodwill or um, you can bring them to the Ark as well. Um, and then you can also bring them to a place like the Salvation Army, but they don't go in your recycling bin. They're not on that list. Um, the, the plastic bags, which are now banned in Vermont, um, those have always had those big bins where you can recycle them. It's stretchy plastic. Um, but the better option really is to bring a reusable bag or a backpack or, or boxes or something like that to transport your groceries. <clears throat> Um, the other things that are, that are issues and that are common contaminants are um, small things uh, like bottle caps that can't, that can't be filled, they can't be sorted because they're too small and they'll fall through the gaps. Those get ground up with that glass and they um, make that glass also contaminated so it's hard to, hard to reuse that. That's one of the big issues with the glass recycling is that there are so many little things like the little uh, floss toothpick things. Those, those fall through, people put those in and they shouldn't go in and they end up in the ground up glass. And that's, um, that's an issue. Uh, coffee cups, those are a mixed material. That's, they're usually lined with some sort of plastic. Um, people don't always recognize that. And so they, they put them in the recycling, but, um, but waxed and plastic lined paper products are not recyclable. Um, tissues, napkins, and paper towels. Those, I mean, if you're, if you're trying to recycle those, um, that's, that's an issue as well. They're usually covered in, I don't know, ketchup or some, some sort of, um, food debris. And then that also, again, if you remember that attracts bugs and, and rodents and things like that to those recycling facilities. And then the workers who work there every day have to deal with that. So think about, <clears throat> 
um, think about that process. And I would highly recommend a visit to one of those uh, material recovery facilities um, once they reopen. Um, then there's the black plastics. Um, we mentioned that before. Those can't be recycled in Vermont. And then in this other, this other image here, you can see there's the food residue issue. There's um, big things like pots and pans. Electronics also are not allowed in the recycling. For one, they're too big. And for another, they have designated recycling options in Vermont. Um, those things, those kinds of things like computers and TVs and things that plug into them are covered under state programs. So they are free to recycle, but only at specific places. We'll talk more about that later. Um, textiles and batteries. Batteries are also an issue. Um, batteries are recyclable, again, through a state program, but not in your blue bin. And the reason for that is that they um, they are actually pretty dangerous. They can sometimes still have a charge left in them. Um, and if they are punctured or if they break, um, they can actually start fires and explode. And um, recently there was, there have been in the news, a number of um, facility, recycling facilities that have shut down because things like that. Uh, people have wanted to recycle their batteries, but they haven't used the proper channels. and. Um, they've gotten, um, they've had huge fires that have been very damaging and very dangerous for all of the people who work at those facilities. So it's very important that you, that anything with a battery that you handle it properly and that you recycle it through the proper channels. We'll talk about what those channels are. Um, the state of Vermont has done a really good job of making that very easy. There are a lot of places that take batteries and things with batteries in them. The other thing that sometimes happens is um, people put uh, other dangerous things in the in the recycling, such as um, pressurized aerosol containers, um, like mace containers, or, um, or or really anything that can explode, anything that's flammable. Um, those things are dangerous, uh, and you want to keep those out. We have specific hazardous waste disposals for those kinds of things, um, and. And all of those things have recycling options, have disposal options, but remember that in your blue bin, it's just those six items that will keep everybody safer and healthier. So, Cassandra, do you want to hop on here for a second? Yep. All right. So okay. we do have a couple questions. Okay. Um, so Kathy, I'm going to answer this one because it goes back. What the heck is happening back there? <laughs> I'm trying to, to get to uh, the next slide, but it's, it's a little it's, out of order, I think. There's a bar on the, along the bottom that if you hover over that bar, yeah. um, it might be a little easier because it'll show you each stop along the way. Oh, OK. It just jumps to the questions between slides. That was, I was yeah. confused about that. Yeah. <laughs> so All right, we, let's take some um, questions then. Usually we lead the webinar by warning everybody that we are, we do these presentations all the time and we can't, we can no longer say we're new at Zoom, but we do have little glitches and bloops and things because um, we're still, we've only been doing this a few months. We usually do all this live. So thanks for your patience <laughs> with that part. Um, okay, so Kathy wants to know, does it contaminate to put shredded paper in the blue bin loose? The answer is yes. If you think about the two by two rule, I mean, it doesn't contaminate in the sense that it's dangerous, the way bag tanglers are, like hoses, bags, textiles, but it contaminates because it will never get recycled. It'll just, you know, just, it'll just end up, if it's loose, the bin gets dumped into a big truck or another sorting facility, and that gets dumped at the, the material recovery facility, really in a big pile on what they call the tipping floor, and then that gets scooped up with a bucket loader right onto the, um, onto the conveyor belt, and by the time all that happens, your shredded paper is just trash on the floor. You might as well just throw it in the trash and get it over with. And um, if any of it does make it into the sorting line, it'll just fall through the gaps and end up in the crushed glass. So that is just going to end up as contamination. So Theron, here's one for you. Um, <laughs> it's for either of us, but I think okay. um, it goes back to contamination. Anonymous asks, um, they say, most people think it's okay to recycle lids. It is if they're screwed back on the, the plastic bottle they came on. But this person says, can we make sure people know this? 
yes, um, you can go out and tell all your friends and tell anybody who is interested in hearing it. <laughs> and, and we do our best to, to let people know that as well. That's part of why we have these, these workshops and these webinars. We want to make it as uh, transparent and as clear as we can um, just how, you know, just how to do this and what the best way to do it is. So this is all part of our, our outreach efforts to reduce contamination and to improve our recycling habits and, and practices. Yeah, and don't forget if the lid is, is wider across in diameter than two inches, then it is okay to throw loose in the bin. And so, you know, lids are tricky it, and be, things changed a few years ago. It used to be you couldn't, you weren't supposed to put lids back on bottles. Then a few years ago, they changed and said you could put lids back on bottles. So I can see why people are confused. But the one thing is, if it's smaller than two inches by two inches, whatever it is, it doesn't go in the bin. Um, here's a question I actually answered in writing, but I just want to hear um, this um, anonymous asks, where are plastic number four recycled? And I had said, and you guys, I think you all should be able to see my answer. Um, essentially, it's taken here at the solid waste. Our district will take numbers one through seven, um, but there are certain places in Vermont where they don't. Um, some, some places are um, limiting the plastics they accept from one, to one through four. Um, so what I would suggest is um, check with your local solid waste management district. Yeah. Um, and again, you can find that online. You just Google solid waste management district Vermont. It'll bring you to a map. And it will show you exactly your town and what, and then what town, um, what district you're in based on your town. And that's where really where you should be looking at um, wh what kinds of plastics are recycled. The law, the universal recycling law only cover, actually only mandates um, recycling numbers one and two plastics. Um, but in a lot of the materials that go to the MRF and it, particularly in our area, and I, I can't speak for the others, um, we'll take one through seven, even though the mandate is really only for one through two. Yeah. Um, um, I see that one of our counterparts um, mentioned, thanks Ellie, um, you can go to 802recycles.com mm -hmm. and that will bring you to a list of all the solid waste district. That's a lot easier than Googling, just 802recycles.com. And I will actually type that in so you can also, it's in the chat box, Ellie just put it in. And I'd like to add to the plastics discussion. So um, plastics number resin codes, plastics numbers one, two, and five are the most valuable because they're the most reusable. So um, you, can, you can try to focus on those three types. Um, I also want to say that there are a lot of new kinds of plastics like um, plant-based plastics and things like that. Those are uh, not recyclable. And in many cases, they're not compostable, um, even if they say that they're bio-based. Um, so those should be kept out of the, the bin as well. Those, those bio-based plastics, those, um, you know, even if they say that they're, they're uh, eco-friendly, they may not actually be as, as good as they say they are. Um, okay, we have a couple questions that did come in through um, through the chat box. Um, oh, it looks like uh, Bummy, Bunmi, sorry, wants to know what's the best way to cost how to set up a recycle business. That's not something we're addressing in this webinar. I would suggest that you contact the state of Vermont if you're interested in setting up a recycling business. Um, that's a much bigger, more complicated issue. This is really, this webinar is about like recycling basics. What goes in the bin, what stays out. Um, but I am happy to hear that there are people looking at setting up recycling businesses. I just think you would need to go to the state of Vermont. Um, or if you're in a different state, go to your state Department of Environmental Conservation or its equivalent to get started. Yeah. Um, there were a couple things I just wanted to clear up real quick. Um, clothing and textiles. We actually don't take that at our additional recyclables collection center anymore. Um, we used to, and um, I think I mentioned earlier, we had a whirlwind of changes through the whole COVID, you know, when the COVID started and throughout those months while it was still new. Um, so we, we don't, we used to take textiles. It was one of the staple things we don't anymore. They are problematic. 
um, but they don't go in your recycling bin regardless. I mean, try to reuse them, try to give them away. Um, but you know, if you can find a place that's accepting clothing, let everybody know because it's a big question for everybody. Where do they bring used clothing now? Um, but don't take it to us. <laughs> we can't accept it. Um, can we go on to the next slide? Are we, I think we have, we've answered all the questions. Um, yeah. And we'll, we've got one pending, but we're going to have another longer Q&A session after this next, these next couple sections. We'll just end with, you know, a little bit of Q&A. Um, so we've talked about blue bin basics. We've talked about what goes in the bin, what stays out of the bin, and why it's important that you keep your materials um, contaminant free. So now let's talk about what else you can do. And we're going to go through a couple sections here. I'm going to talk about what else can be recycled that's does that all of those things like electronics that Theron mentioned do not go in your blue bin. In fact, they are banned from the landfill, but have other places where you can take them. And then Theron's going to end by going through some ideas for how you can prevent, we call it pre-cycling or just prevent having to have waste in the first place, even if recycling is a form of waste, it's something you no longer need or use. So we've had some suggestions about that. We're gonna end with that. Um, so let's go on to the next slide. Okay, whoops. Okay, plastic bags. Um, so Theron talked about plastic bags um, and there is actually, even though we do have a plastic bag ban here in Vermont, um, I'm sure everybody's you know gotten up to speed on that by now, started July 1st. Um, we still have plastic bags that need to be dealt with. And so far, all of the major grocery stores that were taking plastic bags for recycling still are, to my knowledge. Um, so you can drop off your plastic bags at most major grocery stores. We're talking about the big chains, like Shaw's, Hannaford's, Price Chopper, um, those, um, I think Walmart used to, I don't know if Walmart is anymore. Um, they, um, that includes more than just plastic bags. It's really a plastic film recycling. And these are some examples of the types of plastic film that can go in. Um, so like this, this picture here is the, um, there's a plastic overwrap when you buy toilet paper or paper towels, there's usually plastic overwrap that can go in. Um, your bread bags, just shake the crumbs out. This is an example of dry cleaning. If you have a dry cleaning bag, and so really what we're talking about is flexible, thin plastic film. The one thing I would say is if you cannot see through it, if it's like really, really white or any other color and you hold it up in front of your face and you can't see through it, that does not go in. Um, and if you, if you pull it and it should stretch, if there's no stretch to it, that also doesn't, that's trash. Um, so think like the stuff that doesn't stretch is like that crinkly plastic that you might find around a box of crackers or tea or something. That can't go in the, the recycling for plastic bags. But you can get all the information you need at plasticfilmrecycling.org. It's right here. I hope somebody pops on there right now while we're on. Um, they actually have a locator so you can find the closest place where you can drop off plastic film for recycling. And they will tell you what you can put in the bins. Um, the other thing you should know, if some of you are probably already doing this, but um, it's very unusual that the staff at the stores that have these bins are trained in what actually they can take or not take. They're, they're store staff, they're trained in how to run the grocery store, they're not trained in recycling. So oftentimes the staff isn't aware, sometimes they don't know that they take all this array of plastic and um, some of them often think like they only take their bags back. Well, hopefully that training has changed. We have gone around and given the stores posters from you know, the company they work with, Plastic Film Recycling, but this is all set up on a national level and it doesn't always trickle down um, to the people you're face to face with. So just keep that in mind. Um, but typically you should be fine if you're just bringing these. Um, one last thing about plastic bags, these are for residents. These collections that you see at the grocery stores are not for businesses. It's okay if you bring in your plastic bags. But if you're running a business or even a small business, they're not set up for like a larger volume than what people might bring in from a household. Um, so plasticfilmrecycling.org, that, um, that will give you locators and more details about what, what they mean by plastic film. And, um, and they'll show you, I think you can even see what it gets turned into when, after it's recycled. 
Um, let's go on to the next slide, special recycling. So um, I want you all to look at this symbol, the, um, the two chasing arrows in a circle. Um, that is a symbol we're using in Vermont now to indicate special recycling. And that is, what that means is that item is recyclable, but not in your blue bin. It has a special place. Um, and it might be different depending on the item, but once you see that symbol, you know, okay, it's typically an item that's covered by one of Vermont's extended producer responsibility laws, um, EPR for short. And those are the laws that Theron was referring to when he said you can recycle electronics in the state. Um, I would say it's not free. You don't have, typically you don't pay a price when you drop it off, but in some cases there actually are some places that charge. Um, but the other thing is nothing's free. So just keep in mind that even if you don't pay a price when you drop it off, something has funded that recycling collection and it might be through, um, often it's through point of purchase. Um, so, but it's convenient, it's set up to be convenient. So you don't have to have any money with you often, not always, um, when you're dropping off your electronics. Um, but there are a number of EPR bills in Vermont. Um, there's one for paint, there's one for uh, mercury containing devices, and specifically we're referring to fluorescent bulbs here, but there's other mercury containing devices like thermostats and therm thermometers. Um, batteries, that's one that started in 2016. Electronics um, has been around for a while. Um, so each one of these materials is, um, the, the way that these laws work is it actually puts the onus of collecting and recycling the material on the manufacturers of those materials. So sometimes there's an upfront charge, like when you buy a can, a can of paint, you might pay a little bit extra and that helps fund this program. And they're usually run, um, they're run as a partnership between the industry and the state of Vermont. And a lot of the solid waste management districts are handling these materials or helping people find out where to, where they can collect. And each one, um, they have usually a third party handler. Um, and then that, that company will set up a collection points throughout the state. So often the collection points are the same place where you buy the item, like typically a hardware store, or the paint store. Um, and each one of them has a place where you can go online and they'll show you a map where you type in your zip code and you can find out the closest place near you. And they're, all of them um, have collection sites all over the state. Um, can we go to the next slide? Because you'll, um, you'll see each one of the options for looking these up. So paintcare.com. Um, you can also find all this on our website. And it, again, if you go to 802recycles.com and go to your local solid waste district, all the local districts will have this, all of this available on their websites. Um, but you, these each, I know it's a little confusing. There's a different website for each thing, but most of the time you'll find out that there's a, um, that there's a, um, a site that will take, you know, all of these things like we do at, at our facility, we'll take all of these um, or multiples, like some hardware stores will take batteries, lamps, and paint. Um, you know, it's pretty much logical. Like, you know, where did you buy your computer? Find out if they're a collection site or if there's one near you. Um, and just to also, I want to follow up on another point. These are all landfill banned. Um, and it's, it's somewhat like for electronics, yeah, they're bigger than the size requirements, but it's really about the fact that every single one of these has toxic and hazardous materials in them that when released in a landfill, go into the leachate, and the leachate ultimately ends up in our drinking water, one way or another. Um, and in Montpelier, where, where I live and work, that particularly hits home because landfill leachate gets processed through the wastewater treatment plant right here in Montpelier, Vermont, and in a couple other spots around the state. So they literally bring landfill leachate to our water treatment center and then it gets released back into the water system. And all the studies we've read about this show that even after it's been treated, a lot of the chemicals and hazardous and toxic items that are in all of these things still show up in um, trace amounts, but they're there in the water released after treatment. So it's really important that we just keep it out of the landfill because ultimately it comes back to us. Next slide. 
Um, okay, so we have mentioned our facility, the Additional Recyclables Collection Center. We call it the ARC for short. Um, so we take around three dozen items. Our list changes regularly. And we're bringing this up because the ARC is not a regular recycling facility. We don't run a transfer station for trash and recycling like most of the districts do. We run this center and it's really designed for um, the hard to recycle materials. Um, so for example, we take all of those items I just talked about, the hard to recycle, special recycling, um, toxic EPR materials, but we also take a lot of other things like pellet bags and um, you know wine bottle corks and there's a whole huge list. Um, our list changes frequently because our outlets where we can send things to be recycled changes all the time. So we tell everybody, even if you've been a regular customer at the ARC, check our website every single time you plan to go because we post our discontinued items and we post our new items. And we also have our most current brochure on the website. And that's, you can see it here, cvswmd.org backslash ARC. And if you just make it to our homepage, cvswmd.org, there's a button that'll just, you click the button and it'll take you right to the website. So, um, Next slide. Um, we just really want to emphasize that um, that we're not because we're doing hard to recycle materials. We just aren't able to guarantee a stable um, list of items. And we know people get used to recycling. Like we used to take bottle caps for years, and people would save their bottle caps and bring them to us. Well, that ended with the pandemic, and there are a few reasons. One of which is it costs a lot of money to recycle those, and the other is. It took a lot of staff time and volunteers to sort them. And in the process of COVID-19, we had to stop having volunteers and we had less staff time available. So, so markets change. Um, and just if you go in knowing that you won't be disappointed when things change, or you might be, but it, you'll understand why. So we have a few rules. Um, we aren't single sort. Every blue bin recycling we've been talking about, we've been talking about single sort recycling even though we know that's not the norm everywhere, there are places that still require you to sort out your materials. Um, but at the ARC, you have to sort everything. Um, it, it really isn't valuable and we can't send it to a market if the materials we collect aren't separated out. So we recommend that before you even show up at the ARC, you pre-sort. Um, so the first step is go to the website, make sure you have seen the latest copy of our brochure the second step is figure out a system for pre-sorting it. I used to have like little yogurt cups or ice cream containers because I ate a lot of ice cream um, and I would put all the little things in those. Um, but, you know, people do it with bags, whatever works for you. But the reason for that is we are still in the middle of a global pandemic. We have a limited number of people who can go into our facility at any given time. And it goes and, and we also have staff that is trying to minimize their contact with the public as much as possible. So if you come in with pre-sorted materials, it's gonna be a lot faster for you to go through the facility and it'll be safer for everybody. Um, the other thing is some of them require a little preparation ahead of time. We can recycle pellet bags, but before you even come in, they need to be cut open on two ends and then they spread out to be like one flat sheet of plastic and shake them off. There's always a little bit of dust in the bag and um, over when you collect hundreds and thousands of bags, that actually becomes a significant contaminant. So we do require that the bags are cut open and shaken out before you bring them in. Um, and batteries have some, have some requirements as well. We, you need to tape the, um, the terminal ends of the batteries and that's for safety and transport or you can put each battery in a bag. Um, the exception is alkaline batteries, but all of that's on our website. Um, but just know like if you, this, this is an above and beyond kind of recycling. So you, you might have to take another step to figure out what you need to do to recycle it so it really gets recycled and doesn't end up being trash. Um, and again, check the list. And um, I actually have a note here about collecting. We used to have collectors come and they could take home some items. We have stopped that since COVID-19. So there's no more collecting at the ARC. Next slide. Um, yeah, so this was me using a hammer and hammering home the point. If you go to our website, that's how you're really going to know what we're collecting, cvswmd.org backslash arc. Next slide. Okay, so I'm going to pop off and Theron's going to end by talking about pre-cycling 
and ways that you can, some planning and ideas you can do um, so that you have less materials you have to deal with in the first place. Um, and then we'll have a Q&A session when he's done with that. So I see some questions have piled up. We're gonna get to those after Theron talks about um, reducing, reusing, and refusing. All right, hi everybody. So, um, recycle, well, reduce, reuse, recycle. That's the traditional three steps that we, that we have always talked about. Um, the, the next step of that would be to ref start refusing things that you recognize as trash or that you recognize um, are unnecessary or are um, unnecessarily wasteful before you even get them. Um, so <clears throat> ways to reduce, um, you can plan ahead, you can bring provisions with you from home, bring a water bottle, bring a coffee mug, um, bring a, a container with some, some food or something like that. That means that you're not buying um, single use coffee cups, you're not buying water bottles that are just going to end up needing to be disposed of, um, you're not buying um, takeout food. Um, that you don't need to, you'll save money, you will save wasted materials, and um, it's going to be, it's going to be better all around for you. Um, things like reuse. So um, I, I mentioned this with, with the glass jars, for example. Um, you can use them for, for um, storing things in your fridge. You can, maybe if you, if you can, um, food, you can reuse them for that. Um, the other, the other thing about reuse is, um, you know, it, it's, it's another way to be thrifty, another way to, to save money. You can reuse, um, materials and, um, products, uh, like, like get clothes from, um, from thrifting and from, um, stores where they're like secondhand stores. Um, that saves a lot of, of material if you're if you're getting something that for example doesn't fit somebody else they bring it to that store um it didn't fit them anymore but it can have a second life with you um <clears throat> same thing with shopping bags reusable shopping bags um you know use a backpack when you're shopping um all of these things will save on waste they'll save on disposal cost and um you won't need to be using raw materials to make more shopping bags, for example. Um, when we get into the refuse section, that's, that's things like straws. You don't really need straws. You can drink out of a cup. Um, maybe if you do need a straw and you absolutely can't do without it, you can get a reusable straw or you, you get one straw and then you wash it out and reuse it multiple times. <clears throat> Even, I mean, it's, it's plastic, it's gonna last for 10,000 years. So <laughs> you might as well reuse it. Um, things like paper napkins and bags. Um, if you don't need the, to, to get a, like a whole wad of paper napkins when you go to the, the coffee shop, um, don't. I mean, just, uh, just say, I don't need any napkins. Maybe you bring a, a little handkerchief with you and, and then that solves that, I mean. Um, there are a lot of steps you can take just by preparing, by thinking about what you might need during your day. Just bring those things with you in a backpack or something. Um, it'll, it'll really help with reducing your waste. Um, and then um, we can get into unnecessary packaging. So there, there are a lot of things that, um, that are unnecessarily packaged. I mean, single, single packages of... For example, I'm just going to go on to this next slide. Um, there's uh, single packages of, of fruits that are that are packaged and they already have a, a, a peel or a rind on them. Like a banana doesn't need to be wrapped in plastic, you know. Um, something, something like that can be avoided. Um, either you don't buy it or you, you talk to the person who works at the store and say, um, you know, tell whoever is packaging this not to, not to do this anymore. <clears throat> um, so I'm back, back here on the reduce. The, these, are, um, these are just different ways of, of thinking about 
the, the materials that we use and the, the wastes that we produce. Um, <clears throat> if, you can, if you can use something that you already have, that's great. You don't need to involve any more resources, any more time, any more money. Um, and then if you can borrow or swap or trade with friends or neighbors, that's another great way to save resources. Um, I like to make a lot of things. Uh, that's, that's another great way. It does take time though. Um, and you can always buy things, but, but try to be conscious of, of how much you're buying and of how much waste you're producing and, and the things that you buy and what they ultimately will be. So here we are on the refuse thing. So you can see that, for example, there's um, an eggplant in a bag and there's a single potato wrapped up in plastic wrap. I mean, they already have skins on them. Um, all you need to do is wash it. You don't need to have it individually wrapped. That's just a lot of trash that's being produced for no good reason. Um, and then we already touched on some of these other things, but if you can, if you can do without some of these things, um, like straws and bags and utensils, or if you can just bring a, bring a set of chopsticks, bring a fork in your backpack with you or a spoon, um, then you won't need to get those plastic ones and, and you won't need to throw it away later. <clears throat> so as for reuse, um, the district does have a number of, of products that we, that we sell for, for this kind of thing. These are produce bags and there's a utensil set. Um, there's some reusable shopping bags, but it's just as easy to just grab a spoon out of your, your kitchen drawer and bring it with you, um, throw it in your backpack. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't need to be a fancy one, um, but these are very nice. Um, <clears throat> And then we talked a little bit about buying secondhand, about borrowing. Um, if you if you have any skill at making things, you can you can sew yourself together a reusable bag and use that for grocery shopping. Or you can just use um, use an, another um, bag that you got in some sort of packaging, or maybe somebody gave you a gift. Just reuse it. So I noticed there were a number of questions that were coming up. So Cassandra, do you want to hop on and uh, read some of those off for us? Okay. So most of these we've covered, and um, but not not all of them. So um, let's see. One person says, "Can we tell Amazon and Zappo and other companies that our boxes are too big?" Of course, yep. I would recommend that you um, contact any retailer you're working with if they have uh, packaging that's more than you want. And one choice is to contact them and let them know that you'd like to see reduced packaging. Another choice is to not shop there. And I, <laughs> I realize that saying don't shop at Amazon is kind of a tough thing right now, but that is a choice. And, um, and that's a choice when you go to a store and you see something that's overly packaged too. Um, Theron, can you take this one? Can aerosol cans be recycled? Aerosol cans. So <clears throat> aerosol cans, there are a lot of things that come in aerosol cans and it kind of depends on what's in there. Um, if it's something that is hazardous, flammable, um, or, or poisonous like pesticides, things like that, those need to be brought to a household hazardous waste disposal. Um, we have a number of those every year in our district towns for our residents. And there's also the Chittenden Environmental Depot that accepts those materials year round. You can schedule an appointment to dispose of those kinds of materials there. Um, if, however, it's an aerosol can that is, uh, say, like cooking spray, as long as it's empty um, and completely empty, um, I believe that you can recycle that in your in your scrap metal bin or your um, or your recycling. Is that is that correct, Cassandra? Yeah, the the like things like Pam cooking, right. just like cooking oil. oil in a in an aerosol. I think that'd be fine. Yeah. Um, okay, here's a one. I'm not sure we can answer this to tell you the truth, but we could start a conversation. Um, this person wants to know: Is there a way we don't send unusable plastic to poor countries? So I think what you're getting at, what the question is getting at is, um, you know, speaking to the whole issue of how we used to send our recyclables to China, China 
started, you know, when China closed the doors on that a couple of years ago, um, some of the recyclables in the, in the US started going to other countries and those other countries got overwhelmed. Um, so I think that's what is the question here. And I think that um, I'm not sure we are equipped to answer that honestly, except to tell you that since China, which was you know the major place where we used to send our recyclables, since they really did close the doors and that, that, that was all about contamination they were getting so much contamination in the recyclable that were sent to them from the US that they, um, they made a nearly impossible goal. I think it was half a percent um, contamination. And yeah. half a percent is huge. When Theron and I toured that paper mill where you saw the, um, the, saw the contamination, that was, do you remember the percentage, Theron? Was it like 1% or half a percent or something? I don't remember what exactly it was, but. Less than 1%, but it was still a lot of material and it costs a lot of money to landfill it. So um, the best way to not overwhelm a country that isn't equipped for our materials is to make sure it's not contaminated. Um, the other thing that's happening is that there have been markets that um, are starting to be developed domestically, and we, we were already tapping into those in our state. But, um, you know, those, you know, other, other regions around the country started looking at them too. So, um, you know, those became a little tougher to get into. Um, and the other thing that happened was um, more and more um, companies were looking at setting up recycling domestically. That's all I got because I don't know how many of those have come through. Um, it's just a much bigger question than we can answer in our what goes in and stays out of the blue bin webinar. Do you have anything to add to that, Theron? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a huge issue. <clears throat> um, just the fact that we create so much waste as a society and then uh, don't deal with it properly and don't take responsibility for it. We just send it off to countries who don't really have any other recourse. Um, and then if they, for example, with China, if they implement a policy that, that limits the amount of contamination, then it just gets sent to another country that, um, that has no way to deal with it either. And they, and those big bales of our garbage end up piling up and polluting those other countries. And it's really a political issue um, that needs to be addressed um, in a large way. But it's, it's kind of too big to tackle. So <clears throat> the best thing that any of us can do is take ownership, take responsibility for what we are doing in our lives, in our communities, in our circles and work upwards from there. Um, everything that we can do personally, individually, and as a, uh, you know, ultimately that'll, that'll build on itself, but uh, it does fall to us to make good choices, to be conscious of the waste that we're producing and make sure that we are doing our absolute best to manage it properly and to reduce what we're producing. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I'm just going to add to that too, that another really big problem that I think, I don't know if it's equally as big as plastic, but it's right up there is textiles. Um, there's a lot of information coming out, especially in the last year or so about fast fashion and um, our textiles ending up in countries that can't handle them and they become really problematic. Um, and that's partly why we spent some time on talking about how to um, prevent even having items to, to um, landfill or recycle in the first place. And one of those is really looking hard at purchases of textiles in addition to plastics um, in places where you can reuse or repurpose clothing or think about purchases be before you even make the purchase. Is it something that could be by, bought secondhand rather than, you know, brand new? Um, I'm not, I mean, fast fashion could be its own webinar. <laughs> And I don't know enough about it to go much deeper, but I do understand it's problematic. And a lot of it has to do with really inexpensive clothing that is essentially created a market for disposable clothing. Um, so yeah, these are big topics and it's a global issue for sure. And uh, we're trying to deal with it on a local level, but, um, but that question really got at the global nature of this 
of recycling in general. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions in the Q&A box, so I think we're going to wrap up. And right. I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, really appreciate your interest in this topic. And um, we, we will be sending out an email with a link to the recording. A couple of people did ask about that throughout the webinar. So we'll, not only you'll get the recording in your email box, but we'll also post it on our YouTube channel. So if you lose the email, um, go to YouTube and just, uh, we're at CVSWMD and you'll find, we actually have a couple of these now. Um, and we'll, eventually we'll pare them down to one, but um, it's available there and, um, and you'll get a link to it in a couple days. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody.